Rabbi Wine, dear guests, it's wonderful to see all of you here coming for, to spend two days of your life listening to problems in archaeology, which is <laughs> very strange. You will find it, you will find it, I'm sure, completely technical, hard to understand, provocative sometimes, and I hope you will enjoy. At least you will see some nice pictures. Uh, this first lecture of mine will be a really basic introduction to all this field of our activity. Uh, this branch of archaeology that relates to the Hebrew Bible has been traditionally coined biblical archaeology. Yet this term has become increasingly, increasingly problematic. Is it a legitimate designation? Can this aspect of archaeology be defined as an independent branch of scholarship? If we continu continue to use this term, how should we qualify it? Let us first examine very briefly the two components of the term, archaeology and the Bible. Archaeology is one of the fields of research that emerged during the 19th century and during the 20th century, it developed into a mature, full-blown social scientific discipline with its own research methods and theoretical frameworks. The goal of modern archaeology is to study various aspects of ancient societies by reconstructing spatial and temporal social changes as well as a wide range of economic, technological, political, and religious phenomena and their processes. The scope of archaeology is wide scale and relates to every aspect of human activity that can be recovered by the spade. The questions asked and the answers given are sometimes complicated and often interpretations of the same body of archaeological phenomena may differ and thereby become the subject of, for debate, as you will see. The first task of the, of the archaeologist is to locate ancient sites. The study of the spatial distribution of sites through time is essential for reconstructing changes in the settlement pattern, for establishing hierarch hierarchic relationships between types of settlements, for evaluating the settlement areas in the various periods, and estimating the resultant demographic changes over time. This is achieved through the use of field surveys, combined with the study of ancient geographic, ecological, and environmental factors. Modern research techniques help us in analyzing the settlement pattern in relation to the topography, geology, soil types, land uses, water resources, ancient roads, and so on. When such studies are combined with the results of excavations at various sites, we can achieve an integrated picture of the ancient settlement system. Detailed settlement maps, like this one that you see here, tables and graphs which summarize such uh, studies, enable us to follow changes in settlement and demography through time in a given region and to gather information about such subjects as the response of human societies to environmental challenges. As we shall see tomorrow, this aspect of the archaeological endeavor is essential for the study of the emergence of the origins of early Israel. In the land of Israel, this aspect of ancient settlement is closely related to biblical historical geography, a research field which can be defined as part of the broader field of biblical archaeology. Its goal is to explore the vast geographical data in the Bible uh, in ancient written sources like Egyptian and Assyrian texts, as well as local epigraphic documents. The identification of ancient place names with actual archaeological sites was the first major achievements of, the, of this field following the exploration of the Holy Land by various pioneers over the centuries. Since the fourth century AD, the Episcopus of Caesarea, Eusebius, he studied uh, uh, such uh, problems, a fam famous book that he wrote, Ashtori Haparchi, the Jewish scholar who lived in Bet She'an in the 14th century. And the 19th century scholars like the noted American Edward Robinson, who in 1983 and 1852 carried out the first extensive pioneering exploration of the country in modern times. These scholars were aware of the remarkable preservation of ancient biblical names in the place names of their own time, and in particular in the Arabic names used throughout the region. Some examples include 
בית שאן, for example, which equals בית שאן, בית אל, ביתין, שילה, סיילון, גיבאון, אל ג'יב, and so forth. Historical geography also deals with many other aspects of ancient geography, such as biblical lists of tribal plots and tribal borders, administrative divisions like those of the Kingdom of Solomon, political and cultural boundaries, road system, and uh, much more. The combined efforts of field surveys and analytical historical geography enables to draw important conclusions as to the ancient settlement systems and demography, and to relate ancient texts to the available geographic and archaeological information. <clears throat> archaeological excavations tend to study the inner structures and development of various types of settlements across timeline, from small hamlets of desert dwellers to well-planned fortified cities. The larger sites of the ancient Near East are buried in ancient mounds, which are commonly known in Hebrew and Arabic as tells. You can see one of them here, or here, Tel Batash, which I excavated for 12 years, or Tel Yokneam, which you see here. These sites are located in the most suitable locations for human habitation, and were settled and resettled over uh, hundreds of Uh, and even thousands of years, and thus they often preserve dozens of occupation levels which archaeologists refer to as strata, or layers. The exploration of a single tell or mound might require long-term and large-scale planned projects which may take many years. Each excavator has to address what might seem to be an endless number of questions regarding his or her site. What were the environmental resources of the site, such as water and land? When exactly was the site settled? Was the population stable, or were there population changes or fluctuations? How many occupation phases do the various strata reflect, and can we define gaps in the occupation? Which part of the site was settled in each period? What reasons brought an end to each occupation phase? What was the town plan in each of those occupational periods? What were the building materials and techniques used? What kind of subsistence strategy was employed in each settlement period? If there were violent destructions, who or what caused them? Can we relate such destructions to historical events known from other sources? These are only a few of the many questions which the archaeologist may ask. Reliable answers to such Can you see something here? Yeah. To such questions can be achieved only by methodical, well-controlled excavation methods and a thorough understanding of many phenomena and features in each excavation. The decipherment of the positional processes and of the stratigraphy of the site are most challenging tasks of the field archaeologist. The depositional processes, processes are the result of diverse and sometimes unexpected human decisions and activities of a distant past. The image of a tell as a cake composed of horizontal layers, as we saw previously, or strata, that can be peeled off one by one by the archaeologist was a common one in the early stages of research. But the reality proved to be much more complicated. The, co the correct understanding and documentation of complex, multi-layered sites mentioned in the Bible and related to our issue at sites like Chatzor, Megiddo, Bet She'an, Lakish, and many others is absolutely crucial for an accurate interpretation of these major sites. Less complex, complex yet no less informative, are many other types of sites uh, reflective of human activity, such as isolated farms, hamlets, citadels, agricultural and industrial installations, cemeteries, uh, ancient Um, roads, ports, etc. Desert archaeology and underwater uh, archaeology are two specific branches of archaeological investigation. Both con contribute unique types of data to our subject. For example, cultic sites in the desert of Sinai and the Negev, like this one, uh, have informed immensely about the origins of the biblical standing stones or Matzebot, which you see in this picture. Two Phoenician merchant ships, shipwrecks, discovered just a few years ago at a great depth below the Mediterranean Sea, has provided us with the first archaeological encounter with ships 
like those, like the Tyrian sheep described by Ezekiel chapter 27. The combined evidence of the varied, various kinds of sites provides archaeologists with a wide panoramic view of various modes of human life. In my career of over, over 30 years of excavations in the field, I've excavated two multi-layered medium-sized towns, Tel Kassila and Tel Batash, two multi-layered major sites, Bet She'an and Tel Rehov, as well as a series of smaller single period sites, such as an early Israelite village settlement near Jerusalem, a citadel, a watchtower, a cult site, and a desert farm uh, or a road station in the Judean desert. Each of these sites had a different story to tell about the ancient Israelites' material culture, society, and life ways. Detailed study of the various objects found in these sites is essential for defining temporal and spatial changes in the material culture. We can define regional cultures as well as study the origins and spread of cultural features. We can detect foreign influences, local international trade networks, processes of colonization, immigration, etc. Such detailed research provides the basis for not only relative dating, but together with the aid of firmly dated objects for absolute dating and chronology. There are many examples of the implications of such meticulous studies for biblical archaeology. For example, the study of the Philistine culture as a culture of immigrant peoples became possible only thanks to precise analysis of pottery, like the one that you see here, and other artifacts, uh, and the comparative study with artifacts from Greece and Cyprus. The identification of what is thought to be Israelite material culture in the period of the judges, which we shall dis discuss tomorrow, became possible only with a meticulous comparison of that culture, cultural data, with the Canaanite culture known from the lowlands and so forth. An important aspect of modern archaeology is the wide-scale cooperation with scientists from various fields, such as botany, zoology, physical anthropology, geology, geomorphology, chemistry, physics, geography, metallurgy, computer science, statistics, remote sensing, and so on. This kind of cooperation has opened many new horizons. Uh, I'll show you just one example just from two months ago from our excavations at Tel Rehov, where we uncovered uh, this last summer beehives, the first beehives known from the Middle East, dated to the 10th century BC. Uh, after we suggested the identification of those hives, a scientist from the Weizmann Institute analyzed the clay walls of these hives and indeed uh, identified the remains of bee wax residue. This is just one example of many hundreds of such scientific um, studies. The use of radiocarbon dating, uh, that is measuring the isotope carbon-14 carbon in organic materials, particularly in short life botanical remains like seeds, has become a very important tool uh, for dating. At Tel Recho, for example, we managed to gain a precise series of dates from seeds spanning the 12th to 9th century BC, which have become an important issue in the current debate over the Iron Age chronology and the united monarchy of David and Solomon, as we shall see tomorrow. Archaeological projects also require much technical work, drafting and drawing of architect architectural plans and artifacts, photography, restoration, conservation of objects and structures. Wide use of computer software is needed uh, to handle uh, ever-growing databases, to process quantitative analysis of various kinds, to help in creating typological seriations, and to create three-dimensional images just to mention a few of the applications now used in field archaeology. The collection, procession, integration, interpretation, and publication of this vast data is not a simple task. And the integration of finds from various individual sites into a comprehensive regional picture can be compared to the assembling, assembling of a huge jigsaw puzzle. It is a complex and expensive enterprise. As an excavation director, I imagine myself sometimes standing in the center of a huge intersection surrounded by radiating branches of study and research. And though archaeological fieldwork has its glamour and great moments of discovery, 
The daily routine involves long, tiring stages of documentation, processing of the finds, integrating results, and preparing final publications. The actual work of the archaeologist goes certain, certainly well beyond the popular image of Indiana Jones, the treasure hunters. <laughs> A higher level of the archaeological enterprise is that of interpretation, synthesis, and explanation. This armchair stage of the archaeological enterprise deals with the reconstruction of the broader aspects of social, political, economic, and ethnic changes in a given region or country. The objects um, of uh, research and interpretations are varied. The human response to the environment, agricultural and industrial technology, demography, and uh, uh, so on. <clears throat> The goal is to reconstruct as much as possible a complete portrait of ancient society, from the life of the poorest peasant to that of a king or priest. Questions emerge as to the mode of life of the society explored. Were the people nomadic, semi-nomadic, sedentary? Were the society ranked or egalitarian? We try to reconstruct the emergence of political systems, such as states and empires, to understand colonization, immigration, assimilation, symbiosis of different groups, short and long-range trade. Gender archaeology attempts to study the status of women in society, religious beliefs and cult practices <coughs> are reconstructed on the basis of temples, cult objects, and burial practices. Even cognitive aspects of life uh, that may be deduced from the finds are addressed in modern research. Most of these subjects concern, concern long-term social and technological changes. Yet in many cases, we can detect certain events, usually those that are the more dramatic, like earthquakes and military uh, conquests. Such events are awarding for the archaeologist who excavates them, since they yield abundant finds, of course. Uh, this enables us to reconstruct the full uh, contents of houses and obtain detailed picture of the material culture for a particular historical moment uh, in uh, the history of the sites. A variety of theoretical frameworks were developed over the past few decades in archaeological interpretation. One of the most well-known trends of the last 50 years is the so-called processualist archaeology or new archaeology which dominated scholarship from the 1960s to the 1980s. This approach emphasized ecological and environmental determinism and gave less weight to human decisions and actions. Currently, postmodern ways of thinking have inspired archaeological interpretation, and this stage of archaeological research is sometimes dubbed post-processualist archaeology, as it is known today. It has opened the door for much more varied and flexible interpretation. Various possible explanations for the same archaeological phenomena are acceptable, and the role of human decisions and of the individual in history is not ignored. These trends have direct implications on our subject, for example, in terms of a possible solution to the debate on the historicity of David and Solomon. We shall discuss it tomorrow. Thus, archaeology is a more complex discipline than most people think. Its methods and analytical research and deduction provide the only way to reconstruct a historical outline of periods uh, where there are no written records. While for periods where, where, where we have written uh, sources, archaeology gains significant, impo significant importance as a counterbalancing texts which may be biased or loaded with propaganda and ideology. The land of Israel has been continuously in the focus of archaeological research right from the beginning of the modern era. In the 19th century, it suffered from the infancy of the new discipline. In fact, much damage was inflicted on sites like Jerusalem in the early years prior to World War, War I. Yet in those years, pioneers like Sir Flinders Petrie uh, developed new concepts and methods that laid the foundation for later advances in uh, research. Between the two world wars, American and European expeditions conducted large-scale excavations at major sites 
and laid the foundation for the systematic archaeological research of the Holy Land. These were the years when the concept of biblical archaeology took shape under the leadership of the American scholar William Foxwell Albright. His unique personality and wide ranging knowledge of all aspects of ancient Near Eastern studies inspired a whole generation of scholars. Among them are some of the founders of biblical archaeology in Israel, like Benjamin Mazar and Igael Yadin. This school strived for the integration of archaeology with biblical history, historical geography, paleography, Near Eastern history, philology, and art history into a comprehensive field knowledge. Since 1948, archaeology in Israel and Jordan developed rapidly. The large-scale excavations at Chatzor, led by Igael Yadin, served as a training ground for a new generation of Israeli archaeologists who later developed their own projects and methods of research. American, European, Australian, Japanese, Jordanian teams have continued exploration in Israel and Jordan, and now these countries have become the most intensively and dynamically explored, I think, in the entire world. But how can this vast amount of accumulated data serve to reconstruct biblical history? Now we shall turn to this question. Few words about the historicity of the Bible. Our interest in this colloquium is limited to the question, to what extent can we extract history from the biblical text? And what are the methodological problems involved? After all, the title of this colloquium, Digging for Truth, uh, but can we discover the absolute truth for our field? My answer is a positive yes concerning certain issues, but I have serious doubts regarding many other issues. A wide spectrum of views exists concerning the process and stages of writing and reduction of the Hebrew Bible and the evaluation of the biblical text in reconstructing a history of Israel as reflected in the biblical text. In particular, the biblical stories from the times of the patriarchs to the kingship of David and Solomon are the subject of serious debates. There are those who accept the biblical narrative as true history. They are mostly scholars or authors of religious backgrounds, either Jewish or Christian, who believe in the truth of the Bible and are not ready to give up the biblical stories either as the word of God, or at least as straightforward true history writing. A recent example is a 600-page book that just was published by Kenneth Kitchen, an English-British scholar, famous Egyptologist, titled On the Reliability of the Old Testament, in which he vigorously defends, defends the historicity of the Bible using extensive material from the ancient Near East. His concluding sentence is, the old citation, the Old Testament comes out remarkably well so long as its writings and writers are treated fairly and even-handedly in line with independent data. On the other side of the spectrum stand scholars who all but negate the historicity of the Hebrew Bible and claim that it was written during the fourth to third centuries BC as fiction reflecting the intellectual and theological world of much later writers. Philip Davis, another British scholar, defines, for example, biblical Israel as a modern invention of scholars. Niels Peter Lemke from Copenhagen, one of the main authors in this group, writes, citation, the Israelite nation, as explained by the biblical writers, has little in the way of a historical background. It is a highly ideological construct created by ancient scholars of Jewish tradition in order to legitimize their own religious community and its religio-political religio claims on land and religious exclusivity. This group of scholars have been dubbed revisionists, minimalists, or even nihilists, uh, though they themselves decline any common general term for their school or movement, so to speak. In between these two extremes, there is a wide space for various views which may collectively be defined as middle of the road or moderate. I think that both of us, Professor Finkelstein and myself, are somewhere on this spectrum, though I think on two different parts of this spectrum. An, archaeological, an archaeologist like myself, who is 
an outsider to textual research, must make a choice between divergent views when he tries to relate archaeological data and interpretation to the biblical sources. My choice is to follow those who claim that the initial writing of the Torah, of the Deuteronomistic history, as it is known in literature, that means the books from Deuteronomy uh, through uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, and large parts of the prophetic and wisdom literature, that these uh, writings took place during the late monarchy, 8th to 6th centuries BC, while during the exilic and post-exilic periods, they underwent further stages of editing, expansions, and changes. I also accept the view of many scholars that the late monarchic authors utilized earlier materials and sources. And these can include archives of the Jerusalem Temple Library, palace archive, though the existence of such archive is disputed, public commemorative inscriptions, perhaps centuries old. No Israelite ones have been preserved, but uh, we have uh, such uh, monumental uh, inscriptions from the land of Moab, the inscription of Mesha, and uh, from uh, Aram. The oral transmissions of ancient poetry, this may include the Song of Miriam, the Song of Deborah, the Blessing of Jacob, and other ancient poetic texts, which are dated by important scholars like Professor Cross at Harvard to the 12th century or 11th century BC. Folk stories and etiological stories rooted in a remote historical past. Many of the stories in the biblical literature, such as portions of the Exodus and conquest accounts, stories about the deeds of the judges, the biography, biographies of Saul, David, and Solomon, the Eliah and Eli Elisha cycles, etc. Um, earlier historiographic writings that are referred to in the Hebrew Bible as the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel and the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah, cited in the book of Kings. I cite just one reference of those. Uh, now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory house which he built and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of chronicles of the kings of Israel? This sounds as if the author had in front of him some earlier form of written historiographic texts. It is generally accepted that many of the stories incorporated in the Deuteronomistic literature, though based on folk stories and traditions, were reworked by late Judean, that is, Southern, Judah, uh, theologically and ideologically biased editing. Nevertheless, such stories may retain valuable historical information, which can be assessed with the help of external written sources and archaeological finds. As modern interpreters, our task is to extract any reliable historical information embedded in these literary texts using archaeology as tool of control and increased objectivity. Both Assyrian inscriptions and local inscriptions, like the Stila of Mesha, king of Moab, and of Hazael, king of Damascus, which is the Tel Dan inscription, confirm that the general historical framework of the Deuteronomistic history narrative relating to the 9th century was based on reliable knowledge of the historical outline of that century. Our understanding of the periods preceding the 9th century are, of course, foggier, since Israel is not mentioned in any external source following its lone mention in the inscription of the Egyptian pharaoh Merneptah that dates to the end of the 13th century, around 1200 BC. That is, until we come to the Mesha inscription, there is a gap of 350 years in the mentioning of Israel in these two sources. Thus, the working hypothesis of the view which I represent is that information in the Deuteronomistic history and other biblical texts may have historical value in spite of the distortions, exaggerations, theological disposition, and literary creativity of the biblical authors and editors. I imagine the historical perspective in the Hebrew Bible as a telescope looking back in time. The farther in time we go back, the more dim the picture becomes. Considering that the supposed telescope stood somewhere in the late 8th or 7th centuries BC, it gives us a more accurate picture when we look at the 9th century 
then the dimmer one of the 10th century, and so forth. Oral traditions and stories embedded in the biblical historiography might preserve authentic details concerning events or phenomena closer to the time of writing. While the farther we get away from the supposed events, the stories become more imaginative, symbolic, and perhaps distorting the earlier information. We also have to recall selective memory, censorship, and biases due to ideological, personal, or other motivations. This is true with any history, even of the last century, not to speak of ancient history. One example is the history of Israel War of Independence in 1948. There is an official history produced by the Department of History in the Israel Defense Forces, and there are various other versions, histories, among them postmodern narratives which deconstruct the official history of various aspects of this war. When dealing with periods long past with almost no direct written sources like the early biblical period, it is extremely difficult to assess the biblical data um, and uh, one may ask whether it is possible at all to write a correct or accurate history of early Israel. Now what is the role of archaeology in all this? The correlation of archaeological finds and texts is only one aspect of the archaeologist's work, perhaps one of the most difficult. Yet it is a challenge that must be faced. In light of the conflicting views concerning early biblical history, archaeology can provide external, presumably objective data on realia related to the issues under debate. It has also the potential to provide independent judgment of biblical sources, allowing us to examine their reliability. In addition, it provides numerous observations on many aspects of early Israelite society which cannot be extracted from the Bible, biblical text itself. However, the interpretation of archaeological data and its association with the biblical text is in many cases a matter of subjective judgment, since it is often inspired by the scholar's personal values, beliefs, ideology, and attitude towards the text. In many cases, when archaeological discoveries are utilized in order to prove one historical paradigm or another, we are confronted with arguments that are at their core circular. This was true for William Foxwell Albright and his followers, and is true today. And thus, it should be recalled that many archaeological conclusions are not certifiably fact, uh, no matter when or by whom they were proposed. Despite this, the role of archaeology as an invaluable tool for examining various aspects of biblical historiography and of the early periods of Israelite history, the Late Bronze Age through the Iron Age, remains firmly intact. We will see tomorrow that there are both many correlations between archaeology and biblical references, as well as many contradictions. This situation is only natural in light of the complex process of transmission of information described above. But the role of archaeology is well beyond confirming or denying certain biblical events or other uh, references. It is, in fact, the main tool for reconstructing many aspects of Israelite society, economy, and religion, as well as those of Israel's neighbors. It offers a unique perspective on the Israelites as part of the wider context of the Levant and the entire ancient Near East. Nevertheless, after more than 150 years of research, in this field, there are still debates and discussions concerning the definition of biblical archaeology as a concept and field of research. During the last generation, the term biblical archaeology received some bad publicity. It was considered by many as a field of study loaded with theological and ideological agendas, reflecting religious beliefs, beliefs of Christian and uh, Jewish scholars. We often hear that biblical archaeology's main goal is to prove the Bible, to, so to speak. William Dever, one of the important scholars in this field in the United States, preached for many years that we needed to redefine our field of research as Syro-Palestinian archaeology, thus relocating it in the wider contexts of Near Eastern archaeology, unrelated to biblical studies. A few years ago, the American schools of oriental research a non-denominational academic organization in the United States decided after a long debate to change the name of its popular magazine, Biblical Archaeologist, you see on the left, to Near Eastern Archaeology, you see in the right. 
The change reflected the desire of American archaeologists working in our field to liberate the discipline from any religious framework. In America, the term biblical archaeology continues to be used mainly by conservative Christian researchers as evidence in a new book that just appeared called The Future of Biblical Archaeology, you see it on the left, which appeared last year. Similarly, the Biblical Archaeology Society and its magazine Biblical Archaeology Review, though they are private and non-denominational, reflect in their names a well-defined targeted public. Much of it is composed of conservative readers who are interested in the Bible and its world. The gap between this approach and the professional approach to archaeology as part of the larger fields of anthropology and history uh, is very wide. And this has resulted in the refutation of the term biblical archaeology by many scholars, mainly in this country. Strangely enough, William Dever himself calls now for a return to the old term and proposes that we just add to it the qualifying word new, the new biblical archaeology is the same old lady, but with a new dress of current archaeological methodology and more anthropological ways of thinking. In Israel, the term biblical archaeology has been accepted in a more simplistic way, as a means of referring to all archaeological activity related to the Bible and its world. You can see here a book cover. Two books like this appeared of uh, international conferences that we had, and they were called Biblical Archaeology Today. In my view, the term biblical archaeology should continue to be used as a generic term defining all aspects of archaeological research that are related to the world of the Bible. This is a broad definition that includes vast geographical regions, the entire Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean, Mediterranean from Iran to Greece and from Turkey to Egypt. The archaeology of each of these regions contributes in some degree to our understanding of the biblical world and as such, it is part of biblical archaeology. According to this definition, biblical archaeology is not an independent scientific discipline, but rather a shopping cart that collects data from the various branches of Near Eastern archaeology in studying the Bible in its, and its world. Though written in what was at the time one of the smallest and negligible states of the ancient Near East, the Bible is perhaps the most profound product of ancient Near Eastern world. Many of the achievements of this cultural world rooted in the third, second, and first millennia BC are embedded in it. Many ancient local memories